So uh, welcome back everyone. We're going to start uh, session three regarding adherence to antiretroviral therapy. We're going to have three presentations. We will see the three lectures in a row, and then we'll have a nice discussion with the three presenters at the end. Let's start with Kim Engler. It's a, it's a privilege to introduce Kim. Uh, Kim uh, she's a PhD in public health. She is a research associate at the Center of, uh, for Outcomes Research and Evaluation in McGill in Montreal, Canada, and her research interests center on the psychosocial dimensions of living with HIV, adherence to antiretroviral therapy, and patient reported outcome measures, the PROM development and implementation for use in individual patient care. So the title of the presentation and the review is PROMs and adherence. And Kim, uh, no one better than you for this lecture. Hello. Uh, thank you for the opportunity today to present to you on PROMs and adherence. Uh, I'm especially going to be focusing on adherence to antiretroviral therapy among adults uh, living with HIV. Uh, I'll also be highlighting some of the work that we've been doing in this area. I have no conflicts of interest uh, to declare. So there have been many terms used uh, to characterize patients' deviations from their uh, prescribed treatments. Uh, adherence is meant to connote more of a collaborative relationship between patients and providers uh, relative to some other terms that have been used, for example, compliance. Um, a definition of adherence uh, that I will present today comes from a series of consensus um, meetings, uh, European consensus meetings, which developed a taxonomy from which this definition has been taken. So uh, adherence here is the process by which patients take their medications as prescribed from initiation to discontinuation. When we look at the rates of suboptimal adherence to antiretroviral therapy uh, that have been reported in meta-analyses, we can see that the rates of less than ideal adherence are quite high, even with the um, simplified regimens, for example, single tablet regimens. So while these percentages uh, here are not necessarily comparable because uh, they use uh, different thresholds to adherence, among other things, it's simply to stress the point that adherence remains a relevant issue. So adherence is important uh, in HIV care and research um, because essentially it's one of the key determinants of uh, the goals of antiretroviral therapy, which are to obtain and maintain uh, long-term viral suppression uh, and thus uh, help prevent uh, mortality, uh, morbidity, and onward HIV uh, transmission. Um, it's also recommended that adherence be routinely monitored in HIV care. Uh, adherence is a common outcome in HIV clinical trials. And even among the virally suppressed, um, adherence is worth attending to because um, adherence is uh, recognized as a dynamic behavior, one that can change over time. And there are still some unknowns about the long-term clinical impacts of um, forgiving newer regimens. Um, so regimens that maintain viral suppression despite missed doses. Uh, so there could still be some impacts on viral replication and, and infl inflammation, for example. In terms of measurement, um, measuring adherence, its ultimate goal is to improve HIV care. Um, in this context, uh, in research, it allows us to identify uh, interventions that are worth implementing into care. In practice, it allows us to identify patients who could benefit uh, from adherence support. Uh, but there is no gold standard to measure art adherence, whether in research or care, and there are a wide variety of methods that are used to quantify adherence. Um, these measures have been uh, a distinct, uh, there's been a distinction drawn between direct and indirect measures, um, uh, which I will present uh, in the next slides, and each has its own advantages, disadvantages, and specific assumptions. So uh, among the direct measures we have, well, essentially the definition of a direct measure is a measure that uh, looks at the presence of drug 
in the individual. So um, a direct measure would look at drug levels, for example, in plasma, urine, saliva, drug concentrations, and hair. And as I said, there are both advantages and disadvantages, which uh, for the purpose of, purposes of today's presentation, I won't um, explore. Indirect measures include pill counts, pharmacy refill data, uh, electronic adherence monitoring, HIV RNA. But the indirect measure that interests us most, uh, self-reported adherence to ART, uh, which is a recognized patient-reported outcome measure. It is, uh, in fact, the only measure to directly ask the patient about their adherence and it's credited as being the most widely used measure of adherence, whether in research or clinical practice. Uh, if we look at the review conducted by Marcelin and colleagues um, of um, adherence measures used in HIV clinical trials, randomized clinical trials, uh, we see that in 86% of the studies, um, a self-reported measure of adherence was used, or at least a self-reported measure of adherence. Uh, and self-reported adherence measures are actually recommended for routine use among uh, healthcare providers, unlike other measures uh, such as drug use and pill counts and electronic drug monitoring. The advantages of self-reported adherence um, are its practicality. Uh, uh, they're relatively inexpensive, they're easy to implement, uh, they're associated with a low respondent and staff burden, they're flexible, there are many ways of administering these instruments, and they are widely available. So if we look to a recent review that was conducted on self that um, identified self-reported adherence measures across different conditions, we see that 25 out of the 121 uh, instruments uh, identified were used in HIV and ART. And these are instruments that had at least some assessment of their measurement properties. So the available pool of, of, of self-reported measures used in HIV and ART is in fact greater than that. Uh, so there is some evidence of the convergent validity of these uh, instruments. Uh, they are significantly associated with other uh, indirect measures, such as pill count and electronic drug monitoring. And uh, they are also um, significantly associated with viral load. So if we look um, to the review of, uh, conducted by Simone and colleagues, in 84% of comparisons, uh, self-reported adherence was significantly associated with viral load. But with these measures, there are nevertheless uh, many challenges. So we have the issue of the psychometric quality of these instruments. So in a review conducted by Kwan and colleagues, uh, they looked to see what self-reported adherence measures across different conditions uh, had at least moderate evidence uh, for at least five of the Cosman criteria of quality. And what they found was only, well, essentially none of the measures used for HIV or ART uh, that were identified for this review um, met this criteria. And this includes the very popular ACTG questionnaire of adherence. There are threats to accuracy with these uh, measures, uh, for instance, through a recall bias. Um, medication taking on a daily basis is something that's quite mundane and uneventful, and uh, this could lead to misremembering. And there's also issues of social desirability bias with these measures or intentional deception, um, uh, where scores can be influenced by the beliefs people have about the consequences of self uh, reporting. So, for instance, an individual could fear um, being reprimanded by their provider if they self if they report uh, non-adherence. And both recall bias and social desirability bias can contribute to over-reporting and a ceiling effect, which is a positive skew to the scores. We have the challenge also of great heterogeneity in the measures. So these measures differ in terms of their item content, uh, the tasks that are required by the respondents. So some instruments ask participants to um, provide a global assessment of their adherence. Um, 
while other instruments might focus more on count-based recall, which is remembering the precise number of doses, for example, that were missed. They vary in terms of the number of items composing uh, the instruments, the recall period, the response format, the administration method, the scoring, and even the cutoffs for define, defining adherence. So we see um, the threshold sometimes uh, or often between 80 and 100%. Then there's the issue of the conceptual complexity of adherence. Um, so there are several dimensions of adherence behavior. There is the actual taking of the medication, so whether or not the individual takes the medication, the timing of that medication, uh, whether the person uh, took a drug holiday, um, if there was respect of the food restrictions or other special instructions related to the medication. And uh, some have highlighted that few measures uh, distinguish between types of non-adherence. When there's an actual examination of the content of these instruments, uh, investigators have uh, found two main domains. So one domain would be related to the extent of adherence, so the behavior, and the other domain would be related to the reasons for non-adherence, so the barriers or the drivers behind the behavior. And essentially, uh, it seems that a comprehensive assessment of adherence would involve evaluating more than just behavior. Again, related to complexity, uh, we know that there are a wide variety of barriers and reasons for non-adherence. So here we have the World Health Organization's five dimensions of adherence in chronic conditions. And so we, we recognize that there are health system uh, barriers, social, economic, therapy, patient, and condition-related uh, barriers to adherence. And in our own work, uh, we essentially uh, broke down these main domains into about 20 different subdomains and um, this framework was developed based on a synthesis of qualitative research with people living with HIV so essentially it's meant to represent the barriers that they experience and and uh, spontaneously report um, as affecting their adherence to antiretroviral therapy we did some further work uh, to examine to what extent current adherence barrier uh, measures uh, covered the, con the, the concepts within our framework. So we looked at uh, the conceptual coverage of these instruments. So we looked at breadth, so to what extent the measures actually uh, cover each of the large subdomains. So in our model, we have six domains, and on average, the instruments um, uh, contained content on about four and a half of the domains on over six. And then when we look at depth, so the extent to which these instruments contained um, items on the 20 subdomains, uh, the average depth is seven on 20. And no instrument um, included content on more than 14 different subdomains. And another element that arose from uh, this research was the observation that there is very little, relatively little representation of barriers associated with the healthcare service, well, healthcare services and the healthcare system. So for instance, uh, only 6% of instruments had any items on the patient provider relationship, which was, um, which arose as being very important in our qualitative synthesis based on the perspectives of people living with HIV. Uh, we are not alone in, in observing this. So in a recent review conducted by Kwan, um, they distributed uh, the items across the different, um, the measure items across an, a number of different categories of reasons for adherence and what we see again, is that the uh, healthcare team and system related factors uh, domain <laughs> had the fewest items and that there's quite a, um, a large representation of uh, therapy related factors and patient related factors. In another review um, of generic measures of practical barriers to adherence, um, 
none of the instruments captured all seven of the themes uh, examined uh, by the authors of that review. So another challenge, what I'll call actionability or the capacity of these barrier measures to actually provide information that's use useful for decision making and care. Um, some barriers may be considered by healthcare providers as beyond their remit. Also, some of the most reported and studied barriers may not be those uh, that are most clinically relevant. So if we look to a review that's conducted by Shover and colleagues, the five most common barriers reported by adults on art are forgot, travel, busy, change to routine, and asleep. And if we look to um, a secondary a data analysis of 11 ACTG studies, we see that uh, these, none of these five barriers was statistically associated with HIV RNA. So in conclusion, adherence prompts and HIV are definitely convenient. Um, their choice may be dependent on context, but guidance is available for their selection. Um, they can be further optimized, we know, for example, greater comprehensiveness and perhaps also to address uh, newer concerns. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kim. That was a brilliant presentation. For the audience, just remember that you can send questions through the chat and we'll, we're going to answer all the questions at the end of the session. So let me introduce the second lecturer. Uh, she is uh, Susan Swindles. Susan is a professor of internal medicine in the section of infectious diseases at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. So quite a hot summer now in Nebraska. <laughs> Dr. Swindles is on the leadership of the AIDS Clinical Trials Group of the National Institutes of Health in the US and is a member of the US Department of Health and Human Services panel on antiretroviral guidelines, one of the guidelines most commonly followed in the world. She's going to talk about improved adherence with non-oral medications, mainly long-acting medications. What are the data? So Susan, the stage is yours. Hello, I'm Sue Swindles from the University of Nebraska Medical Center in the US, and I would like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity today to talk to you about improved adherence with non-oral medications. What are the data? Here are my disclosures. So non-oral medications can take many forms as illustrated on this slide, but for HIV specifically, we have two in development by long-acting injection, and there's also some interest in implant formulations, mostly for the PrEP indication. So these uh, uh, others are less advanced for the HIV space. And I don't need to tell this audience that medication adherence is a major issue in HIV. So on the left is a study I did some 20 years ago now with protease inhibitor-based therapy. And the histogram shows rates of virologic failure um, on the y-axis and adherence levels as measured by electronic bottle tops, MEMS caps, on the uh, x-axis. And as you can see, patients needed 90% or above adherence to avoid risk of virologic failure. So the message here is that antiretroviral therapy is relatively unforgiving and risk of treatment failure and viral resistance can develop when patients don't take their medicine every day, which is difficult because they get tired of taking medicine every day. And we hear this often from our patients. And so there is a lot of interest in the patient and provider community in an alternative method. So why would we think about long-acting treatment? Well, obviously less frequent dosing, avoidance of the pill fatigue that we see so often, potential improvement in bioavailability, less adverse events, less drug-drug interactions, protection of health privacy, which is particularly important in HIV uh, because of the associated stigma that patients may face. But does this re re result in improved adherence? Well, I'll present the data that we have and you can decide. So there's actually quite a lot of long acting antiretroviral agents in development or clinical use as outlined 
on this slide. Not all of them will make it, but some of them are quite far along. The two that are the most are cabotegravir, an integrase inhibitor, and rilpivirine, a non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor, both formulated as long-acting injections. And here's an example of some of the phase three trial results that have been generated. So this is the so-called ATLAS study, which is a switch study. And there's a partner study called Flare, which had a similar design and was for patients who were treatment naive. And the primary endpoint at week 48 is shown here. And as you can see in the green bar on the left, virologic success was very high in the injectable arm and in the purple arm, which is continuing oral therapy. And so uh, this met the non-inferiority margin and supports development of this strategy going forwards. Of some concern though, is the fact that the few patients who failed with virologic failure did also develop resistance associated mutations at the time of failure. And these were mostly patients that were from other countries outside the US and had non clade B virus. Important to note that we cannot just blame low plasma exposure for the failures because the patients who failed had similar although at the low end, uh, plasma concentrations to the rest of the study population. And in fact, adherence with study injections was very high in both ATLAS and FLARE studies, which is good, but does not tell us much about uh, how this strategy might work in patients with less than optimal adherence. So do our patients want antiretroviral therapy by injection? Well, in the phase three trials, Patients were surveyed for their satisfaction and preference for injectable therapy. And not surprisingly, as this is a select population who signed up for the studies, there was high levels of both in uh, at week 44 and at week 24. Um, and these are uh, extremely high. Pa patients really liked this. And I've observed this myself for, or as a site investigator for these phase three trials. I've actually been surprised how much patients actually like it. But there are multiple published surveys of patients not included in the long acting injectable studies, so asking about their interest and attitudes to getting their antiretroviral therapy in a long acting formulation. And this is one that I did some time ago with a colleague at Johns Hopkins. And as you can see in the far right bar, a uh, high proportion were interested in getting their medicine this way, particularly if it was administered once a month. So what can we learn from PrEP studies? Well, you all remember this seminal article from 10 years ago showing that uh, tenofovir FTC given orally every day was effective in preventing HIV infection in men who have sex with men. These are the primary data showing a clear difference, although only a 44% risk reduction in HIV acquisition. And subsequent PK data, I think, go a long way to explaining this. So on the left is FTC, on the right is tenofovir, and you can see a marked difference between those who tested positive and those who didn't in terms of levels of the study drugs in their plasma, suggesting that non-adherence was the major region that this study was not more successful. But now we have a head-to-head -head comparison of cabotegravir given every two months by long-acting injection versus the same one pill once a day strategy. Here's the study design. It's called HPTN 083, and patients were randomized to either injectable cabotegravir or oral TDF FTC and followed for three years. And here are the primary data for this study showing a clear benefit to the cabotegravir arm, which is the orange line, and a 66% reduction in HIV incidence, which is a clear demonstration of the benefits of a long acting formulation as compared to standard one pill, once a day preventive therapy. So what can we learn from other disease areas if we don't have a lot of data in HIV about 
uh, adherence and long acting formulations or non oral formulations. So, as you probably all know, these are widely used in the psychiatry field for schizophrenia, where adherence is also a major issue. Osteoporosis, a, lo a long acting infusion, offers convenience for contraception. This provides patients with choices. And prostate cancer, actually, you get all three. So lessons from contraception, these are contraceptive failures uh, with the different methods of contraception available. On the left, there's pills, injectables, and implants. And with perfect use, rates of failure are extremely low. But with typical use, as you can see, particularly with the oral formulations, they're considerably higher. And so with, with implants, the typical and perfect use are the same. So what are the impact of long-acting injectable antipsychotics for patients with schizophrenia? So the majority of patients with schizophrenia relapse after five years, mostly because of poor adherence and discontinuation rates for oral antipsychotics are high, at least a third of patients. Non-adherence is associated with poor outcome, not surprisingly. And there is a, a, a large body of data supporting the fact that long-acting injectable treatment is associated with lower rates of relapse, discontinuation, and hospitalization. Also, cost-effectiveness and quality of life, and patients actually like it. Similarly, in osteoporosis, Patients don't really like to take bisphosphonates every week. At least a third don't take them consistently. And this gets worse over time. And again, the data overwhelmingly support patient preference for a once yearly injectable product, in this case, an infusion of zoledronic acid. So what about data for long-acting antiretroviral therapy in patients with adherence difficulties? So as I mentioned, uh, all patients in the clinical trials had good adherence. They had good adherence in the phase three trials, and they needed to have good adherence to be eligible for the trials. So this is a very select population that doesn't really inform the discussion very much. But there is an ongoing study sponsored by the ACTG called Latitude, which is enrolling people with HIV infection with previous non-adherence. And the first step in this trial is oral antiviral therapy with financial incentives. And again, the patients do need to achieve a viral load of less than 50 to proceed to the randomization stage where they get long acting antiviral therapy versus ongoing oral standard of care. And here's where we are to date. The team have screened almost 450 participants and enrolled 202, so a high screen, fa screen failure rate. And the demographics are shown here. So this is a very important study, but it will be a while until we are able to see results. We have a few from the compassionate use programs that the pharmaceutical sponsors developed for patients that need to take antiviral therapy parenterally. So they've enrolled 35 patients from 10 countries. Here are the demographics. And at the bottom, you can see the primary reason for patients needing compassionate use injectable therapy. And I think most of us clinicians have patients in our populations that fit some or more of these criteria. So what are the data to date? So this slide is a bit hard to read. The green bars are baseline virus loads. And you can see here the virus load at last follow-up. And most patients did achieve undetectable viremia, although not all. And in fact, five or 14% of these 35 had incomplete responses and stopped the injectable treatment. Four of them had a resistance associated mutations to NNRTIs and two to integrase inhibitors at failure, which is also a concern. So uh, one of the concerns patient uh, providers have about uh, managing patients with monthly or every other month injections is what to do if patients don't show up for their injections. So there is a strategy for this based on PK modeling. And in the studies and in the model, missing uh, injection within seven days was no problem. Greater than that, though, 
the patients require what's called oral bridging, which is where they take oral cabotegravir and real piverine until they can get back in for their injection. And depending on how late they are, uh, the injections may need to be uh, the loading doses again, or can just continue with the regular injection dose. So as long as you can actually find people and get them some oral medication to tide them over until they can come in for an injection, this is probably manageable. But implementation of this long-acting injection therapy is going to be challenging. So this is a, a cartoon of some of the issues that will need to be addressed both at the patient level and at the clinic level in terms of workflow and logistics. We don't know yet in the US how this is going to be handled by insurance companies and antiretroviral treatment providers, how much it's going to cost, but change is coming. So those of you that are in the business of treating patients with HIV need to get ready for this. This strategy is already approved in Canada, cabotegravir and ropivirine. The European Medicines Agency has recommended approval and the US FDA is anticipated to approve this in the first quarter of 2021. And with that, I'll just thank uh, everyone for listening and the organizers for inviting me and take any questions. Cool. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Susan. Uh, we're going to hear the last presentation. So it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Bonaventura Clotet. Uh, he is, uh, we have heard uh, two women, so we want uh, gender equity boys, so we need a man. And uh, we're gonna have uh, Bonaventura Clotet, he's head of the infectious disease department in the University Hospital Germans Trias in Badalona, Barcelona. He's the director of the retro retrovirology lab in Sikasha and the president of the Fight, AIDS, and ID Foundation, and co-director of the HIV uh, IVACAT project for the development of uh, an AIDS vaccine in Catalonia. Uh, besides all this, he has been in the HIV field since the very beginning, and he is a far-sighted scientist. He has always been. So it's a nice title for him to talk about a difference in 2030. What will people living with HIV be taking? So Ventura, when you want. So it's it's my pleasure to to present uh, the, the the treatment for HIV uh, as a uh, which will be the therapy in 2030. So I am very thankful to the organizers for inviting me. These are my disclosures, and uh, the. Uh, development of antiretroviral th therapy has been very successful uh, and in only 10 years uh, since 1987 to 1996 uh, we were capable to develop drugs that uh, could uh, control viral replication and since that moment many different uh, compounds came out uh, with uh, more potency and less toxicity and we have now more than 30 drugs and uh, 10 different classes and although we continue developing antiretroviral therapy and uh, uh, we have very exciting compounds coming coming soon uh, when I prepared this slide uh, uh, this concrete slide a few years ago I thought that in, in 2030 uh, we could uh, uh, face the end of the AIDS epidemic. Uh, hopefully that will, could happen, but still there is a lot of work to do. And uh, for that aim, uh, we need to uh, make available generics mostly to sub-Saharan countries. Now, these days, uh, we have uh, these compounds, uh, which are the, the single tablet regimens, brand names. And being very sincere, I, I need to write down these names and to take a look to them in order to uh, remember uh, uh, what they uh, mean. Uh, because by heart, sometimes it's difficult to, 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 to remember, to don't forget 
the, the compounds that uh, are included uh, in these single tablet regimens. But these are very promising uh, strategies. But of course, we need the, 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 that, um, the antiretrovirals, uh, more, the most potent ones, mostly the, 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 the integrase inhibitors, become uh, uh, available soon in order to make them uh, uh, use, uh, the, to, to provide them to the countries which are uh, with high uh, percentage of, of new infections and requires therapy to all infected people to, to stop the, the transmission of the HIV. Therefore, uh, we have to, to, to think of how cheaply could medicines be produced and widespread access to generics in low, in low income countries uh, uh, would be uh, will be very important and when patents uh, have expired drugs should be available uh, available worldwide uh, at those uh, at close to the cost of production however few national health service you know this cost and there is widespread overcharging and pricing transparency is needed and lower cost for generics could drive down pat patented drug prices in the same therapeutic area. And uh, this is uh, uh, very important these days that we are suffering this sort of tsunami, which is the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, the economy of, of the world uh, will uh, be uh, very impacted by the crisis and we will need to have uh, access to therapies that should cost less than it used to cost in order to to cope with this treatment that so far the therapy for hiv is is uh, for life and therefore we need uh, low cost of this therapy but i selected the the the, the drugs that are uh, upcoming uh, to, to to focus on them because they are very very exciting and probably in 2030 they will be very frequently used. And I, I, I divided the upcoming new drugs in entry inhibitors, long-acting inhibitors, and RT inhibitors. Uh, regarding um, entry inhibitors, let me start by uh, Ivalizumab, which is a humanized IG4 monoclonal antibody that blocks the entry of human HIV-1 uh, by non-competitive binding to the CD4 receptor. In this slide in purple, we show how ivalizumab is attaching to the CD4 receptor. And regarding the, the, the potency, ivalizumab has been tested in patients with advanced disease. And in this uh, context, when the baseline CD4 counts are higher than 50, the efficacy achieved uh, with ivalizumab is uh, very high, like is shown in bars here, and the reduction in, 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 in the viral load is also very, very significant in the, in the, in the context of very advanced population. In, in, uh, and uh, it was shown uh, in this multi-drug resistance uh, uh, HIV infection, uh, people harboring multi-drug resistant viruses that prolonged therapy with ivalizumab was uh, effective, but uh, in, in, in few of them there was emergence of diminished uh, susceptibility that was uh, proof in vitro. But anyway, this is a, a, a weapon that we could be using uh, in those that we need to rescue and have developed significant resistance to different uh, available drugs. Another uh, uh, compound uh, is uh, Fostensavir. Fostensavir is first-in-class attachment inhibitor. It uh, binds to GP120 and prevents, prevents one, one GP120 binding to CD4 and is active against R5, X4 and combination of both viruses. When tested alone for a, a week period, Although not impressive, but significantly superior to the placebo, uh, it, show, it was shown that uh, a, a close to a log decrease in viral load was achieved, and then the, 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 the drug should be combined with uh, uh, other uh, 
drugs that could make them more potent. Uh, also, in, in the Bright study, so when uh, using combination, we, we, we observe significant uh, decrease in viral load for uh, 48 weeks when uh, uh, combined with uh, other uh, almost fully active drugs. Now, when we focus on long-acting inhibitors, uh, long-acting cabotegravir and rilpivirine administered together has been shown very active, uh, very potent, uh, during uh, since the uh, three years ago, so uh, uh, we have seen several studies conducted uh, with these uh, two compounds. And uh, when looking at the uh, com uh, com when we have uh, uh, compare compare both the 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 standard of care versus cabotegravir and rilpivirin, we can observe similar efficacy in both strategies. And then, uh, when uh, we analyzed the atlas uh, uh, results uh, achieved uh, every uh, during uh, 48 weeks, the conclusions are that are these are uh, um, this combination is, is is very potent, and biological suppression is achieved in a very high percentage of people. The majority of of them prefer every eight week every every uh, uh, eight weeks every well, it is every two months than every every month every four weeks. So now we have uh, uh, the the possibility to dose every two months this in innovative strategy that will make uh, uh, more comfortable the antiretroviral therapy to many people. Another lo long lasting uh, 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 effective compound. Uh, is uh, uh, lenacapavir. Lenacapavir is first in class uh, HIV capsid inhibitor and acts uh, in, in uh, multiple processes uh, essential for viral replication. Uh, and as it is the capsid disassembly, the virus production and capsid assembly. And uh, it has been shown that uh, lenacapavir might last for six months achieving values uh, above IC50. Uh, when using uh, the slow release uh, administration in a subcutaneous uh, manner, we need to uh, uh, start with uh, uh, oral uh, loading dose uh, for uh, achieving immediate levels, and then we can administer subcutaneous levels, and this could last for uh, six months. Another long lasting is Lenonlimab, which is a humanized IG, IG4 monoclonal antibody that blocks HIV entry by binding, binding CCR5 with high affinity. Do not block the natural activity of CCR5 in vitro and is active against multidrug resistance, including maravidog resistant viruses. And this compound uh, can be uh, administered every week and uh, it has been shown efficacy uh, with highly efficacy uh, during 48 weeks and uh, there are trials showing that could be administered as a, as a monotherapy study in those that are, are, have uh, um, undetectable viral load and not harboring resistance and also in combination studies with other compounds in those that may be harboring resistance. And uh, the last two compounds I want to focus on are the uh, reverse trans transcriptase inhibitors, Islatravir and Doravirin. Islatravir is a first in class uh, translocation in 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 inhibitor that prevents the opening of the nucleotide binding site. Additional uh, nucleotides cannot be incorporated into the viral DNA. Is as I said, a first in class and it's a very potent one, that together with Doravirin, which is a next generation NNRTI, uh, that uh, is active in, uh, in, uh, in front of viruses, harboring the most common resistance mutations to uh, the most frequently used so far NNRTIs, 1A3N, 181C, 190A, and combination of these mutations. 
but it has been shown very, very active and very potent. And it has been proposed to combine in the future islatravir and doravirin as a dual therapy that could be uh, very active, very potent, and uh, could uh, uh, also be used replacing uh, current therapy, which could be not uh, very well tolerated. As a summary, treating in HIV in 2030, I would say that in high income resource countries uh, with long acting regimens, uh, we will use long acting regimens weekly, monthly, or even less often, uh, twice per year. But we have to take into account the cost and the crisis that uh, will might still be present uh, despite that uh, we have uh, 10 years ahead. And, uh, but and in the other side, the in poor resource countries, genetics and most integrase inhibitors at a very low price will be used and will allow to treat near all infected population and therefore block HIV transmission and, and, and achieve the, 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 the goal of uh, no more transmission and uh, the end of HIV uh, epidemics. And hopefully attempts to cure uh, HIV will have been uh, achieved and uh, using uh, uh, latency reactivation agents plus therapeutic vaccines plus broadly neutralizing antibodies. I'm convinced that this combination will have demonstrated that cure is achievable, and then we will need to progress more in the combination of these strategies, but I, I hope that we will arrive the day that we will cure, cure HIV in infected population. Let me uh, finish by special thanks to my colleagues, uh, Julia Maria Libra, Eugenia Negredo, Julia Blanco, and Javier Martinez Picado. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you very much, Ventura, for this nice uh, review. One of the good things of the COVID pandemic is that you can be in Nebraska, in Montreal, in Barcelona, and here we are all together ready to answer some questions. We have uh, some time, so let's let's going to start. The first one is for Kim. Uh, Kim, uh, uh, approximately 95% of our patients have an undetectable viral load of patients on treatment. So uh, I have to admit that in our uh, office, when we see someone with an undetectable viral load, we don't ask too much about adherence, only about a, a self-reported adherence, which is not very trustable. What's your opinion? Should we do something else in real life? Okay, I think you're touching on a very important issue, definitely. Um, so in our own work, we're, we're trying to sort of uh, get around this issue because often uh, with measures of adherence, um, and even measures of, of um, reasons for missed doses, uh, the event has already occurred. The, the, in a way, the damage has already occurred. And so we're left trying to address a problem that has already occurred. So in the development of our own measure of barriers to art adherence, what we're trying to do is develop more of a preventive measure. So it's a measure where we will ask um, you know, patients about things that could contribute to difficulties taking their treatment. So um, they don't necessarily have to have already missed a dose. It could just be factors that um, lead them to making taking their medication more difficult. So that's, I think that's one of the issues that we're hoping to address with our measure um, um, and, and hopefully have more of a preventative tool in, in use in routine uh, care. So I think that that's how I would answer uh, that question. And if we go one step beyond, uh, for instance, in subjects with low level viremia, which is a uh, uh, subjects that uh, worry a lot, both uh, the patient and the physician, uh, uh, the guidelines recommend to stress adherence, to interrogate specifically the adherence. Some hospitals can do plasma blood levels of, the, of some drugs. But usually you have to uh, trust in a questionnaire. Is there any questionnaire you can perform to uh, assess the adherence? I'm sorry, your question is uh, we have to trust in the questionnaire to assess adherence? Yeah. Okay, so you're saying that the questionnaires are potentially fallible and um, that there, there are potentially issues of, of bias related to these questionnaires. Is that what you're touching upon? Yeah, particularly in patients, for instance, with 
with low level baremia where there is a suspicion of uh, irregular adherence. Exactly. Okay. Okay. So I think uh, as it's been addressed in, in some of the other presentations on proms, proms sort of just lift the curtain. Uh, they kind of open the can and there is um, with the, in, there's a lot of important work to be done once the information is revealed. And I think that, I mean, I think a lot of these these proms um, are, con are supposed to be conversation starters. So if there is a situation where there is a divergence between, let's say, the self-reported measure of adherence and also, let's say, the, the clinical data, well, maybe it's just an opportunity to be able to um, address this dis dis this, uh, this divergence in care to try to figure out um, uh, what is behind that. If the patient, let's say, is reporting high adherence in the presence of uh, low-level viremia, is it because there's a different understanding about what adherence is? And it's interesting because we've done some qualitative work on this on, on adherence uh, to sort of validate our conceptual framework, uh, specifically with the patients at the Chronic Viral Illness Service at the Naval University Health Center. And in, very often the interviews will start off with, with the patient saying that they have no adherence problems whatsoever. They have no difficulties. And then as the interview progresses, then you realize, oh, well, there's a different understanding of adherence. For one patient, for example, it was taking the medication once a day, irrespective of what time that they took that medication. So there's sometimes there are different, there's sort of like different understandings about what is good adherence. And maybe these, these, this is an opportunity to, to, to examine that in the context of care. Thank you very much. We go to Nebraska. Uh, Susan, uh, uh, all the implementation programs and studies show a high satisfaction with uh, long acting capotegravid and bilbibrin. What uh, do you foresee are the major difficulties in implementing this in real life in countries where it has been uh, uh, authorized and they are using these treatments? What are the difficulties they have encountered to implement this in their hospitals? Uh, great question. Well, uh, so far, it's really only been uh, approved for use in Canada. And the last time I checked in with colleagues in Canada, they told me that COVID has pretty much sidelined most of this implementation. And so, you know, now that a lot of visits are being done by telephone, it's not a good time to try to get people to come into clinic to get an injection. But there are uh, many, I think, challenges to overcome that clinics are going to have to face. You know, right now for patients doing well, on therapy, maybe they only come every six months, but if they have to come every month or every other month and uh, see an, a trained nurse to get their injection, can the clinic absorb that kind of volume? You know, you've got to uh, have an inventory for the medicine and um, uh, one of them has to be kept cold. Uh, just how are we going to roll this out? How are we going to track people that miss their injection and miss their appointment? and try to get them back in or give them more bridging. So it's going to add a significant workload, I think, to already busy HIV clinics. Not, but having said that, there's a lot of interest in it, and I think we're all going to have to somehow make this work. And in real life, uh, have you created or have you been thinking in any strategies to deal with uh, patients on Cabo Realpi? long acting that don't come to receive their treatment uh, to the office yeah. because in clinical trials they are very high they are highly motivated patients but in real life you can lose some patients what do you do yeah you absolutely. so I, I in my presentation i did show a slide on some um you know windows that you may have where if someone misses for a week or something you're probably okay but uh if you can't get them back in then the the fallback position is what we call oral bridging, which is where you give them cabotegravir and rupiluri orally. So somehow get the medicine to them so that they can take that until they come back in. And we know from the clinical trial data that the, this, this worked quite well, even though, like you say, the patients were very adherent and very motivated. Obviously, some of them had to travel. Remember when we could travel and you know they went somewhere and um, we had to arrange for oral bridging and that seemed 
uh, very successful in the clinical trial. So I think that would be the option. That was when we could travel. I know, exactly. <laughs> we're supposed to be in Amsterdam, aren't we? <laughs> Here's a question for both for Ventura and for you, Susan. How can we understand the differences of the efficacy of cabotegravir, long acting, in PrEP and in antiretroviral treatment? Because in clinical trials of antiretroviral treatment, it's non inferior in FLARE, ATLAS, ATLAS 2 month. But in PrEP, we have two studies, CHPTA in 083 and 84, and it shows superiority. Superiority to uh, TDFFTC, which has already a very high efficacy. So why is it that it's more, or it can show superiority in PrEP and not in clinical treatment? Want to make sure you want to have a go with that one? I give, I give the floor to you, after okay. you. So um, I think the, the simple answer is that if you look at the rates of virologic suppression in the therapeutic trials or treatment trials, they're both very high. You know, it's like 95-ish percent in both. So it's extremely difficult to show superiority over that. The level, the bar is very high and you need an enormous study, I think, to show a difference. And so that's why non-inferiority is, is the best method, best method. But for PrEP, the bar was much lower. You know, we had, you know, 60% efficacy with oral uh, TDF-FTC, and uh, it was a lot easier to show that the injectable therapy was better. I, since I made these slides, we've seen the results of 084, which are spectacular. So. Those that are not familiar, this is an HBTN study of long acting cabotegravir every eight weeks compared to oral TAF FTC in women in multiple sub Saharan African countries. And it was 90% effective in preventing HIV acquisition, which is just fantastic. Uh, actually, yes. let, me, let me just add that I, I, I totally agree with you what you said. Because in fact, the PrEP with uh, TDF FTC is based the efficacy on the adherence. And you have, when you tease out the data uh, obtained so far, you see that only those that really are very committed to the, to the, to the treatment and they take every day the medication and, uh, and then they, they are protected to probably closely to 90%, but the majority then uh, globally, uh, um, so uh, taking into account the, the, all the population that uh, participates in PrEP studies, then it's around 60%, like you said, because some of them, they forget the medication, which cannot happen with injectable uh, drugs. So that's why it's, it's extremely important to, to really try to convince authorities to, to facilitate the use of injectables, at least in in poor resource countries and even in some in some areas uh, in in in, uh, in Europe and United States where people is uh, not willing to adhere or we foresee that they will not adhere because they mentally are rejecting uh, everything. So it's a way to protect them is injectable drugs. Yeah, the, 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 the hypoth uh, you are absolutely right. The hypothesis is the same. So treatment is very efficacious, but some people are not going to have a perfect adherence. So if you have uh, some drug that is given uh, by an injection uh, under medical supervision, maybe you are going to show superiority. And that happens in PrEP, but not in antiretroviral treatment. So to be honest, did you expect it would be superior in, in, the, in the HPTN trials? <laughs> I, mean, I was very pleasantly surprised by the results, particularly if you look at the clinical trial data for women, it's even worse than for men. And so I think maybe we have found something that women are uh, really going to, to like and actually want to use. And, and just parenthetically, there's even a, a injectable contraceptive that's given every two months, the name of which escapes me, but there's potential where women could get, you know, both at the same time, it'd be two injections, but that could be a um, really ideal regimen for a lot of women at risk. Yeah. Well, there's a question for Ventura. Uh, regarding the new drugs you described uh, in the pipeline, which one of them do you foresee is going to be a game changer? 
What's your bet? <laughs> well, uh, to be sincere, uh, there is not one game changer. So we are very lucky and we have uh, 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 a significant number of compounds that might make the difference and can be very helpful in different settings. I would say that that as, as more uh, uh, compounds are, uh, are available, become al available, then we can uh, play better uh, with uh, the, the strategies that will fit uh, with our patients, mostly regarding side effects and uh, some intolerance and so on. So uh, I, I would say that is latravir and doravirin could be a good uh, two compounds uh, that could be very, very useful and, and very, very safe. But uh, also, I do believe that that uh, integrase inhibitors uh, plus 3TC, so mostly dolutegravir, is a combination that can be very helpful for uh, for treating our patients and also for protecting them from emergence of resistance. In the uh, regarding uh, NRPIs and also even regarding integrated inhibitors. So I think we are lucky. We are plenty of weapons to use for uh, against the HIV, and uh, I will not bet for any special one. I will bet uh, bet for uh, the opportunity we have to tailor the therapy to to our patients, which makes us to feel very happy. Mostly those that we were at the very first day. Uh, fighting against HIV, and so now to realize that we are plenty of drugs, that it's like a dream, so. I agree. We are very lucky that we are still developing drugs for a disease with such a high efficacy rates with the, the treatment available. Uh, it's a question for Kim. Uh, Diana Barga uh, asks you if you are going to validate the measure of uh, adherence with direct measures of adherence. Do you if we're validating the measure with? Uh, direct measures of adherence. Any direct measures of adherence. I understand if- I'm so sorry. Okay, I didn't understand. Um, yes, uh, ultimately uh, we're, we're planning on, on validating the measure with a direct measure, probably with the pharmacy data, because that seems to be the simplest uh, way to go and, and the most uh, cost effective. Uh, we've been working on the development of this instrument for, for many years now, and uh, it's been a long and winding road. So we're gonna, we're, we're slowly uh, going towards uh, more efficient routes to get this, this measure out. And so, yeah, definitely we're gonna be looking at, um, eventually at, uh, at the correspondence of our measure with the pharmacy, uh, pharmacy data. Okay, and the last question uh, goes for Susan. Uh, Nance Cunningham asks you, why would uh, long-acting agents have uh, less drug-drug interactions? Because it seems like it would be more due to the long tail uh, with the long half-life. So uh, any comment on that? Why would they have yeah. less drug-drug interactions? So that's a great question. And the theoretical underpinning for this is because it's an injection rather than an oral medicine, then you bypass uh, all the first pass metabolism. So just as a, a for example, you know, you can't co-administer real piverine with acid blocking drugs because it requires an acid environment to be absorbed properly. But if it's an injection, theoretically, that's not an issue. So some of this is based on modeling. We have a little bit of actual PK data in humans to show that there are still some important drug interactions, for example, rifamycins, which are traditionally hard to co-administer with anything, don't, don't work with cabotegravir and milpivirine. But the idea is that not having to go through the GI tract will decrease some drug-drug interactions, but there's much work still to be done on that. Okay, thank you very much. A nice discussion, but I'm afraid we have to close due to time. I, uh, I must congratulate Biology Education for organizing this educational activity, and particularly Christina Damas for being uh, uh, there to facilitate everything. I encourage all the all the participants to go to the to the 
poster session now. We have uh, more or less one hour to view the posters now. And remember everyone that you must complete the evaluation uh, to receive uh, the, the credits. And it's very important for us to receive your evaluation of the, all the sessions. And see you tomorrow at uh, 15 uh, European time at 15 p.m. Uh, uh, different time whenever you are based. Uh, we have tomorrow sessions four and five. So thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed and you learn a lot. See you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye, Susan. Bye-bye, Kim. Bye-bye.